Hi everyone, in this video we'll be talking about percentage yield and percentage purity in the context of chemical calculations. Before we start this video, it would be good if you could spend some time to review all the formulas that we have learned in calculations of mass, volume of gas, volume and concentration of solutions, as well as in stoichiometry and limiting reactants. At the end of this video, you should be able to apply the concept of percentage yield and percentage purity in carrying out chemical calculations. In the context of manufacturing, percentage yield is a very important uh, measure because how much product that we can get out of a reaction determines the amount of profit as well, right? So if we can make more product given a certain amount of starting material, of course that will be the most ideal. So for those of you who love ice cream, baking, uh, so on and so forth, you probably have used this particular compound known as vanillin, which is the molecule that imparts the flavor and aroma. Uh, of the vanilla beans into the food. But to harvest vanilla takes a lot of effort and a lot of time. Uh, it also takes time for the vanilla to, to actually grow and there are certain months where you can harvest it. So in terms of uh, meeting the demand, there needs to be some other uh, solutions rather than just rely on the growing these vanilla pots. La. What scientists did was to try to make the same molecule artificially in the lab uh, using different starting materials. One of the earlier methods uh, is shown over here where they actually used uh, sources such as coal, tar or wood pulp which is much cheaper than growing and, and harvesting the actual plant itself. If you look at the procedure, this is uh, what they actually do. You might find some of the methods here quite familiar like the use of a separating funnel, uh, the use of crystallization and evaporation and separation techniques. And you know that when you carry out a chemical reaction, you are going to lose certain things somewhere. Maybe you spill something, or when you do filtration, some of the stuff is left on the filter paper. Or uh, when you do crystallization, the crystals grow from the solution, right? But the solution still contains uh, a bit of the dissolved solute. So in circumstances like this, you actually get a lower yield uh, of the product because you lose your materials along the way as you carry out. So the more steps you have, in this method, the more likely you're going to lose some of the, the compounds as you carry out your experiment. La. So the question here is, which of the following will cause a reduction in the yield? If you think of an experiment as a series of steps, then definitely there will be product loss uh, during transferring. Let's say some is stuck on the filter paper. There are also reactions which are so-called reversible, which means that when some of the products is formed, they decompose back to form the starting materials again. Okay, or they react back to form the starting materials again. Uh, so that is also possible. So you may not get 100% conversion of the reactants to products. So these are the two main factors that will cause a reduction in the U. Reaction time and heating, uh, not really, unless you are doing it such that um, the product that you want decomposes to form something else, and then uh, you may get a lower U at the end. Okay? I'll leave you to think about the question regarding social and environmental issues on your own. But uh, to stress that when we manufacture something, we want the yield to be as high as possible because that relates to an efficient process. So the yield is expressed as a percentage. Okay, we have this thing called the actual yield, which is how much we actually get out of the reaction versus the theoretical yield, uh, which is how much you should obtain. So you can think about it in the context of baking muffins. So let's say you buy a pack of muffin mix and it says on the box enough for 12. Okay, then somehow when you go and do your baking, uh, you transfer your batter into the muffin cups, right? And you find that you only have enough to bake 6 muffins. Okay, so theoretically you should have 12. Actually you have 6. So a 6 out of 12 would mean that you have a 50% yield. Okay, so somehow or rather you lost 50% of the product to different reasons. Lah. Okay, uh, that is the most basic way we can understand percentage yield. So it's expressed as a ratio of these two quantities. So the percentage yield can never be greater than 100%. You can already guess that, right? So if you buy a box for 12 muffins, you can't get uh, 14 or 15 muffins unless uh, you add in more flour or any more eggs. So you need to put in more starting materials. If the actual yield is greater than 100%, right? That could mean that there might be some impurities that went in such that you get more weight. Okay, but that weight itself is actually impurities. Okay, so uh, over here the answer is no. 
Okay, second question. When we put the ratio of the actual over theoretical U, do you think we should be using mass or in terms of moles? What do you think? So both can be used because if you were to put the mass over MR as the numerator and the mass over MR as the denominator because they are the same thing, the MR will cancel out, right? So you can use the mass over mass or moles over moles. In the case of gases, you can use volume over volume. All right, so it doesn't really matter here. Uh, so it depends on uh, what is given in the question and what is most convenient. I'll be going through with you some examples. They may or may not be the same as what is uh, in your notes, but if they are not the same, I'll be uploading the answers that you can check later on. Okay, but just work through the examples with me here to have a better understanding of how to carry out the calculations. Okay, so over here we have the first example where methanol reacts with butanoic acid to form this methyl butanoid and water. Okay, so in the experiment, I have five gram of methanol reacted with excess butanoic acid to produce uh, methyl butanoid, and they say thirteen point two two gram is isolated. If we are talking about the percentage U, right? What is the formula? We start by writing out the formula. 13.22. This is the actual U because this was what was obtained in the experiment. So we need to find what is the theoretical U. That means by right, uh, if I put in 5 gram of methanol, what is the amount that I should get? You can use your mole ratio, right? So the first step is to find number of moles. Number of moles of methanol is the mass over MR. If we want to find methyl butanoate, we do the mole ratio. We will expect to get 0.15625 moles of methyl butanoate. And from there, if you times the MR, which is 102, you should expect 15.93 grams. Okay, so we can sub in the value. This is your theoretical, then this is your actual. So your final answer here should be 82.9%. So you realize that this is quite similar to stoichiometry, just that we have one additional step where you have to sub in the actual and theoretical U to do the percentage calculation. Okay, so that will be the part that is new to you over here. All right, let's try another question. You may want to pause the video, uh, read it first, then I'll go through with you. Okay, in question two, we have 12 gram of nickel carbonate in excess. Okay, to 40 cm cube of 2 mole per dm cube sulfur acid, which is the limiting reactant. Okay, that means all the acid will be reacted. What is the mass of unreacted nickel carbonate? So let's calculate the number of moles of sulfur acid first, which is concentration, 2 times volume, 40 over 1000. Remember, convert to dm cube. We have 0 0.08 mole. So given this is 1 is to 1, okay, we can just write it like that. The number of moles of nickel carbonate should also be 0 0.08 moles. Mass reacted times your MR, which is 59CO3, 9.52 grams reacted. So mass unreacted is your original 12 minus 9.52 gram, which is 2.48 gram. Okay, 3SF. Okay, part two is about percentage U. So let's write the formula again. 10.4 gram is my actual. Let's find the theoretical. Okay, so theoretical, we're going to use the number of moles that will react. So we know this is 0 0.08 which will give 0 0.08 moles here, which will give us this, which will give us this. Because they are all 1 is to 1 is to 1 is to 1. So that's pretty straightforward. Okay, so the number of moles of nickel sulfate would be also 0 0.08 mole. Okay, so the mass is equals to this times the MR, which I think is given in the question, 281, and you get 22.48 gram. Okay, so the percentage U is 10.4 divided 
divide by 22.48 times 100. Okay, that will give us 46.3%. So why is the percentage U not 100%? There are a few reasons. So the first reason is loss during transfer, as we've mentioned, maybe when transferring the, the solid from one place to another, some of it is left, uh, let's say on the filter paper. Uh, the second thing is, if let's say you're carrying out crystallization, when you crystallize the solid, you, you still have the solution, saturated solution that contains some of the, the dissolved solute. Okay, so you don't get 100% uh, separation and maybe when you do the washing step when you wash the crystals if you don't use a little cold distilled water what happens some of the crystals may dissolve so that is for percentage U identify from the question what is the amount that is produced if that is not given then one other quantity will probably be given to you uh, we can give you the percentage U then they ask you to calculate what is the actual or theoretical U. Okay, so of the three things, one of it will be given in the question. In the next section, we'll be looking at percentage purity. We go back to the topic of separation techniques. The idea of purity is very important because when it comes to, let's say, food or medication, for example, if there are impurities, it may cause an allergic reaction or can cause harm to us, right? Um, percentage purity is a very important concept in the manufacturing industry as well. So I'll leave you to read this uh, history of the discovery of aspirin, which is a common painkiller. In the earlier chapters, when we talk about purity, one way of measuring whether something is pure or not is by using the melting point, right? So how do we do it? We will measure the melting point of our aspirin sample and compare it with the theoretical value of the melting point of pure aspirin. Then how do we know if it is pure? So if it's pure, the melting point is fixed, right? And if impure, that means if it has impurities, the melting point will have a range of values. So this is a recap. The second way to tell whether something is pure is we can carry out chromatography. So how aspirin is being made is you start off with salicylic acid, you add a molecule to it, carry out the reaction, and then you get the product. So what you see in the chromatogram, salicylic acid is your starting material. This is your product. When the student made the aspirin, carry out the chromatogram, shows that you have the product, pure aspirin, which is what you want. You have some of the starting material because there is the same location, the spot. And then you have this unknown here, which you do not know why it is. Let's uh, take a look at the question. What information does the chromatogram give about the purity? So definitely you know it's not pure because there is more than one spot, right? And what does it mean when you say not pure? It has three components, okay? So apart from the spot that corresponds to pure aspirin, there are two other spots showing unreacted salicylic acid and another unknown substance. So we try to be as specific as you can. Don't just say it is not pure. Uh, we try to elaborate. What do we mean when we say it is not pure. So aspirin itself, uh, we represent it by a simplified formula with a box here. It is an acid, it's a weak acid actually, which dissociate to give us the H plus ions. The acid reacts with alkali to form salt and water. The percentage purity of aspirin, how do we know? So the question asks us to calculate how pure is the aspirin. So you must assume that in the sample of aspirin that you have here, sample, Okay, there are some impurities in it that do not react with sodium hydroxide. So only the pure part of aspirin, the pure aspirin reacts. When we apply the formula and do the calculations, we're actually finding how much pure aspirin there is. Okay, so if you look at the formula, this 0 0.3 gram right, is your entire thing, the impure sample. So let's do our calculation. We find out how much of the sodium hydroxide has reacted. Mass of NaOH reacted. 4 gram per dm cube times the volume. When we do calculation, always find number of moles. Huh? So we take mass divided by the molar mass, 0 0.001645 mole. So given that they react in a one-to-one -one ratio, the number of moles of aspirin is also 0 0.001645 mole. And very simply, we can find the 
mass of pure aspirin. So it is rather pure, it's 98.7%. So when we have an impure substance, the yield of the product will be affected. So let's say if you want to decompose calcium carbonate by heating it, if I have uh, one gram of pure calcium carbonate or one gram of impure calcium carbonate, which will produce a lesser amount of carbon dioxide gas. You may want to think about it. So we assume here that the impurities do not take part in the reaction. So the impure calcium carbonate will give us definitely a lower amount of carbon dioxide. Okay, so let's try a couple more examples. We start by writing out the formula first. I just want to highlight here that the values that you sub in must be mass. Huh? It cannot be moles in this case, not like percentage U. Because percentage purity, your denominator is impure substance. You can never find the number of moles of an impure substance because it is a mixture. A mixture does not have a fixed composition, so therefore there is no molar mass or MR when we talk about mixture. Okay, so remember, unlike percentage purity, what you sub in here must be mass and mass. Okay, so what is given 4.8 gram of impure copper, can sub in, then I have 95% purity. Okay, so let's sub in the values first. Mass of pure copper will be then your percentage purity, 95% times 4.8 gram. We find number of moles of copper. The mole ratio is 2 is to 2, which is 1 is to 1. The number of moles of copper to oxide is also this. Right? Okay, so therefore, the mass of copper to oxide will be times the molar mass. Okay, so 5.70. In the experiment to determine the percentage of iron in the iron wire, so let's draw a model here. So my wire sample has 4.80 gram of which a certain amount is impure retis. This amount is what reacts to give 1.8 dm cube of hydrogen. This is the impure mass. So the only value that we can use here is the 1.8 dm cube. I will start by finding number of moles. So this is 0 0.0750 mole, right? If we cross the bridge here, number of moles of these two iron is 1 is to 1. Number of moles of iron is also 0 0.0750. So the mass of pure iron would be 4.20 gram. Okay, so the percentage purity 4.2 divided by 4.80 times 100%, we get 87.5%. Okay, so that's all for this video. I'll see you in class.